This is Kevin Neely. Kevin. Hey, Sam. <laughs> Kevin is one of my oldest friends and um, I, somebody I regard as a brother and a mentor um, for some 15 years, I guess. I don't know how long we've known each other. I don't know. It seems like forever. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, you know, really helped me when I was going through my transition. You were really instrumental in keeping me safe and sane, I think, during that time, which was tumultuous and um yeah we've been through a lot of stuff together but i was really yeah. curious to talk to you kevin in particular because you're a social worker and i regard social workers as the most um belabored people in the, um, america probably and um yeah and and because you are trans and you've been through your own stuff so the, that those sort of intersections were curious to me um, as to how how you were able to keep going because that's tough stuff. Well, particularly I think the social working stuff is, yeah. Mm. That, was, that was a lot of questions. There were, um, yeah, it was, uh, like, it was an yeah, that, was, that was that was a lot. Yeah, it was an was introduction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. you're a social worker. Yes. Yeah. yeah. First, let me thank you. Thank you for uh, the kind words that you said. So the social worker piece, I, I started out my career uh, as a teacher mm -hmm. and I taught social studies uh, for quite, quite some time. And um, at some point realized that I used social studies as a vehicle to teach social justice. And about uh, 2009, I, you know, talked to my my wife at the, you know, my wife, I'm just say at the time, she's still my wife. So it's at the time <laughs> end now. And, um, and yeah, exactly. And asked, um, you know, what she thought about me going back to school because I had come to this, I don't know, I, I, I hate to say realization because then it, it like makes it sound like there's some kind of trajectory. I really don't know if there really is or not. Um, but that I, that I wanted to go back to school for social work. Mm -hmm. I had um, come to this place in teaching that I realized that the students that I wanted to work with, um, I, couldn't, I couldn't reach them the way that I wanted to be able to reach them in the classroom, hmm. uh, like per se, right? Like a, in a classroom versus like an office. Gotcha. Uh, so when I went back to school, I, uh, I, and I would say that also, I mean, like to even, to even go back um, maybe farther, there was uh, no doubt in my school counsel's mind that I would amount to nothing. And I remember that. Like, I remember oh, uh, him, damn. Mr. Kunz, I'm going to say his name, like, <laughs> like, Mr. you know, yeah, exactly. I, I swear I've like emailed him and like posted on Facebook his name so many times after <laughs> each of my, after each of my master's degrees, like mm, Mr. Kunz. Um, <laughs> he, he really, he really, and maybe he was trying to inspire me that way. He certainly did. So, uh -huh. um, it occurs to me that he, he, he was not trying to inspire me, but um, I, I was going to amount to nothing. And, and I see myself in all of the students that I work with. I see myself in every student that I, 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 I work with, mm -hmm. regardless of their situation. I feel like sometimes, well, I shouldn't say regardless, because there are some students that go through things that I never did. Um, I had a fairly um, challenging childhood, I would say. You know, my mom was an active alcoholic. Um, the other day, I saw this thing on Facebook about what did you learn to drive on? Like, what car did you learn to drive on? Mm -hmm. um, it was a it was a standard. It was on the column, but I have no idea what kind of car it was because um, I was probably eleven. Um, wow. I had to learn to drive to drive my mom home from. Um, <laughs> we're gonna, we're, yeah. What, <laughs> my my door just opened that'll oh. be that'll be a that'll be a cut okay. um so yeah so I, I used to i used to have to drive my mom home well i I, re I distinctly remember one time that i had to drive my mom home because she was so drunk she couldn't drive and i think i was like we were still in vermont like in shaftesbury so i was probably 11 12 uh -huh. years old so it was pretty young that i learned to drive um so there was so there was so, so there was all of that childhood stuff. And I, it occurs to me that many folks that end up in the helping professions <laughs> were either people helped or not helped by other helpers. That's like, right. Know, like, That's right. Just responding to the things that we got or didn't, you know, that we got or didn't get. 
And yeah, then at I'm, the same time, yeah, go ahead, please. Oh, I just, I meant to say that actually up front was that, you know, social workers are usually driven by something, usually mm -hmm. something from their childhood or some, yeah, anyway. Yeah, I do, I do think, I, I would say at this point in my life uh, that I, uh, that I'm called to my work. Yeah. I think that it's a, it's a spiritual calling. When, when people say, like, like what you just said about, um, you know, how we're, you know, overworked and, you know, the, uh, I, I just don't feel that. That's I don't great. feel it because it just feels like it's what's meant to be for me. Um, and I've come to this place where I honestly feel like most of my job is to just be witness to things that I can't change. Mm, I mean, wow. I'm just, I, I just sit with people who, who experience poverty or experience domestic violence or, you know, especially adolescents who often, I think, don't feel like there's someone that sits with them. Yeah. Um, yeah so that's, that's, that's true. yeah, that's, that's, that's the kind of, that's the kind of social work that I do. Um, I, I work in a school. It's a, it's an alternative high school. Uh, I don't think I really ever left high school. <laughs> I hated it. So I keep reliving it over and over. <laughs> Trying to get it right. I really, I really <laughs> like it. Yeah. But then it, like, can I, like, it, it you know, and, and to sort of juxtapose, though, to that Mr. Cunz, I had uh, Mr. and Mrs. Morgan mm -hmm. um, and Mr. X, who was my senior English teacher, who believed in me. So I had educators that believed in me and I had educators who sold sold me short. Yeah. Um, and I don't I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that educator that sells sells a student, sells a youth or a young adult short. I want to be able to be there and just be present. And yeah. I, and I, and I don't any longer believe that I can fix anyone or anything. Right. Right. Um, but here's the, the thing, like of 50. Gotcha. You know, I mean, educators had a huge impact on me. My, the, the adults in my life were absolutely pivotal, absolutely important to me. So, I mean, that's a, that's a really intense position to be in. Yeah, I think there's a lot of there's there's a lot there is a lot of responsibility. I've seen it handled uh, and used well, and seen it handled and not used well. Yeah, um, I mean yeah. we're human beings, and yeah. that you know we're 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 made of clay. We are definitely not not to be put on pedestals. Yeah, um, it it uh, I I will always fall fall short of that. Um, but I do. I love I love my job. I love mm -hmm. my job. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't I don't. Uh, yeah, I've been at this. I've been at this high school about three years. Mm -hmm. I've worked at most of the inner city high schools in Raleigh, and um, this is by far my favorite. I love my principal. Um, I mostly love my dean. <laughs> I wonder if she's watching this. <laughs> well, it's not I do, live. I do mostly, yeah. No, I do. I do mostly love her. So, um, cool. you know, she would probably say the same about me. She mostly loves me. I got to be a pain in the ass to work with. I can't even imagine. <laughs> not saying a thing. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah. 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 But you know, I just was, uh, I was thinking about your tumultuous upbringing, you know, and um, how that has impacted the way you are in the world today. Um, you mentioned that you were driving mom, a drunk mom at 11. What was going on at home? You know, it's so funny. I had a therapist uh, when I first got sober. That's part of the story, obviously, too. But I had this therapist who, who would say to me, "Now, where was your mother?" <laughs> and so that was like my my childhood was, um, you know, sort of absent parenting um, mm -hmm. for for quite a bit. I mean, my sister was. I have an older sister and a younger brother, uh, but my mom was. Um, my dad left uh, my mom when I was nine. Oh wow! And she she drank a lot, um, yeah. Probably before that, but when he left, that was kind of the end. Mm. I don't I don't think she really ever thought that that would happen to her. Mm. Oh, okay. Um, and it really undid her in in a lot of ways. Uh huh. Um, and it's funny. Like I think about um, I I kind of thought that like one of our first questions would be, you know, what do you remember from your childhood? And the funniest thing is, I don't I don't really remember my childhood. I remember the childhood stories, right? Like I remember uh -huh. the stories that were told to me of my childhood, uh -huh. you know? So I remember stories about my, I mean, my mom was tell me stories about how I used to sit in front of the dryer and wait for my dad's clothes to come out and hope that they had shrunk to my size. So at whatever <laughs> age, like three, four or five years old, I'd be sitting in front of the dryer, like, and I'd pull out his t-shirt, his white t-shirt. 
don't know why oh they were buying God. some white t-shirts for God's sake. Right. But, you know, but it was the it was the sixties. You know, it was the you know I was born in nineteen sixty four. So, so I mean, you're my four mom, years younger because, than me. Yeah, so she Three wouldn't. Years. You know, she wouldn't have known. She wouldn't have known what to do with me. I mean, I was a, a tomboy. Yeah, um, same. there are a lot of tomboys, but same. there probably aren't. Don't end up trans. Um, mm-hmm. She, she. Uh, I mean, I really feel like they, you know, they did the best they could, certainly with that piece. But I, I always felt like I didn't fit in. You know, I just, I just, you know, and, and from my from my earliest memories, like this feeling of not fitting in. Um, right. So you're not having like specific memories, but a sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it sounds like you have a very strong sense about uh, the way that your parents were in the world too. Um, certainly from long conversations I've had with my mother um, before she died, like she, she, you know, she expressed the things that I feel like I understood about her. Um, oh, yeah. You know, she, she was an only child and um, with, she was the center of her parents' universe. She wanted to be the center of all universes. Uh, <laughs> that was yes. just, it was just their way, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so many people, you know, are like appalled when they hear that she died on my birthday. But it was just, it's just like my mom <laughs> had to share that with me too. I'm like, well, of course, she died on my birthday. She had to be a part of everything, mm-hmm. you know. She was she was the center of the universe in in wow. so many ways. But that kind of the way that I just said that. Mm. I could never have done that 10 years ago. I would not feel the same. I'd just be pissed at her for dying on my birthday. You know, right. I think even, yeah, so that's, so the childhood was, was difficult. Dad left, you know, lots of dad abandonment trauma. Mm. Um, and, you know, it, it, it probably nine, 10, 11, you know, there were things that um, just did not add up for me you know, as a, as a girl, right. So here I am as a girl and Mm -hmm. my mom started making me wear bikini tops. And I was like, why? Like, what's the point of all this? Yeah. Yeah. I I didn't want, I didn't want any part of that. Yeah. And, um, you know, I drank, I drank pretty, pretty heavily through high school, like the end of middle school, high school. Do Um, you have a moment? Like I have a moment of a memory where we were going to a party and I must've been like, six or seven and my parents insisted that I wear this dress and I lost it I hurled myself on the bed and had such a temper tantrum and fit like it it was so mm-hmm. painful and and awful to me I had I, I like had this fit mm-hmm. do you remember the fix I don't my mom tells me or she told me that I at some age, like there are pictures of me. I have this picture of me mm-hmm. that I have this white dress on mm-hmm. and I have shaving cream all over my face. <laughs> yes. the sink, shaving. Right? Yes. Yeah. So it was sometime <laughs> around there, like three, four years old, that I just refused to wear dresses. I just didn't wear dresses anymore. I have a picture of me here. in the bathtub with shaving cream on. Yeah. 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 And, you know, again, I, I what 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 all that was, I don't, you know, I, I had this um I had this doctor the other day to talk to me about um, a five-year-old that they're they're working with that clearly can articulate mm-hmm. this gender dysphoria. I was not that five-year-old. Mm. I was not. I could never have articulated that then. Even if I don't even think if we lived in the world, if I lived in the world today, mm-hmm. the way the world is now, mm-hmm. I don't think I could have articulated that. Oh, but interesting. Because of all the other stuff that was going on. Yeah. It was, sounds chaotic. You know, yeah, there was there was just too much other stuff, and and you know, and being that really insecure, uh, fearful kid, that that was that was the mental energy uh, until I picked up a drink. I mean, it was probably you know eleven, twelve years old. I I I found you know the apricot brandy that was up on the shelf that my yeah. father had in. Actually, that might have been nine because that was before he left, um, and. You know, I was I was off like whenever whenever I could, mm-hmm. I drank. And then once I mm-hmm. found you know found pot, like I, I I smoked as much pot as I could. And yeah, um, you know I I remember uh, sitting sitting at a bar um, on my 18th birthday, like thinking there wasn't enough booze there. Wow, bar, yeah, like, full of booze, right? Full of course, booze. there's plenty of booze, but yeah. And I drank I drank like that for seven years, like mm-hmm. with intermittent trying to stop, knowing I had a problem with alcohol and. And um, in March of 1990, yeah, I, I, I knew. I mean, I mm. knew. And my mom, my mom was an alcoholic. She got right. to 79. She put down the alcohol and started uh-huh. like tons of weed. 
We've got great <laughs> stories, but that's not, you'll have to. You'll Sober. Have to, yeah, yeah, you'll have to, you'll have to bring her back to talk about her story. Yeah. So you're smoking a yeah, lot of pot, yeah. you're drinking. Smoked a lot of weed, drank a lot. And, you know you something's know, not right. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, of course, you, you, I didn't have a language for it. Uh-huh. You know, it was, it was um, you know, in the late 80s, I got, a, I got a DWI. You know, I tried to get clean again. And I went to my first meeting. It was a ACLA meeting. And, um, you know, I said the Lord's Prayer. And I just, I burst into tears. And I knew that I was in the wrong place. Like I, I knew mm-hmm. I was in the wrong place. Mm-hmm. I started going to AA. I was in a little, I lived in a little town in um, Vermont. And, mm-hmm. um, actually, no, I didn't start going to AA. I went to a, um, I got an appointment with an outpatient therapist. How, really how old were you? 25. 25. Okay. 25. Before that happened, like, were your friends like something is up with Kevin with our friend something is a happening is you know did was there any sort of intervention did you go to therapy because I I was depressed and I was acting out and I was going into like psych units and stuff like that Mm -hmm. no there there wasn't there wasn't that I think I was I think everybody around me drank like that yeah like there I think everybody did I mean so nobody saw it yeah no one yeah no one I don't think anyone I mean Certainly the women I dated did not like how I drank mm, mm-hmm. that, that I, I know that. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't date any well I didn't date. I took hostages. So, yeah. So, right. Yeah. You know, I loved, I loved hostage taking. Uh, clearly they loved me too. Cause they came along. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I would say, um, no, I never, you know, I got, like I, I got arrested. I got arrested once, had, you know, got a DWI yeah. um, and uh, I almost got a, a, a domestic violence charge. Mm. <laughs> My girlfriend was beating the shit out of me. Okay. Right. But, like I'm the butch one, so I got the you know they, you got they, the rap. Yeah. They ended up dropping that. They, when they went back to go to court, it was in California. Mm-hmm. When they went back to go to court, they had lost my file. Nice. Yeah. Got to text fools and drunks, right? Yeah. Wow. I was all of the above, so I got some extra. I got some extra <laughs> coverage. Extra loving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I and mean, I knew I knew I had a problem with alcohol. Uh-huh. I mean, I was I, I just I shared this the other night at a meeting that. I, um, I slept with the light on probably the last year of my drinking. I was so afraid of the dark. Wow. I was 25 years old. Wow. You know, I was afraid yeah. of the dark. I was afraid to be alone. Yeah. Um, I was, I, I, yeah, I was desperate. I was very desperate. The last like weeks of my drinking, I had no idea what would happen, whether I would black out or really not feel like I was drunk. Mm-hmm. And I was always a lightweight, Sam. I was always a lightweight. I always threw up. Mm. Like it didn't matter. Like it didn't matter. I did learn not to mix. Like I could not drink and do drugs because that would guarantee vomiting. I could. I just could not. Yeah, that's not true. Probably like cocaine and alcohol were fine. I wouldn't vomit on that. If right. I smoked pot and drank, I'd be. I'd be puking. Well, that's a tough always one. a lightweight. Always allergic to alcohol. Uh-huh. No, but but couldn't stop like yeah. still, still did it you know yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I hiked the grand canyon and um obviously like you're in the grand canyon yeah. and i think that you could not find alcohol <laughs> the ranger came over and offered my girlfriend and i a beer uh-huh so i drank a beer and then the entire night felt like there were ants crawling on me wow it was it was the worst experience I, and i realized i could never have a one beer again. one beer yeah I didn't realize that it was the first beer that got me drunk. I just real I just thought that I needed always to have more than one beer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, the logic, mm-hmm. the, the the stoner's logic. I always had that. Yeah. And 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 really, for a long time, I just smoked pot. You just it was what? easier to get pot oh, before pot, eighteen. Yeah. It was way easier to smoke. Yes. I got tons of pot. Yes. The seventies and eighties were lots of lots of lots of pot. Yeah, I mean, for twenty dollars, you got you know the four finger bag, and yeah, yeah. it was crazy. Yeah, cheap and it cheap was, and, it was and plentiful. Easy to get. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I used to sell I used to sell joints in the smoking area at school. I right. Them in my Marlboro box, you know, I can't. Yeah. I just can't believe I never got caught. I drank at school. I, I don't understand. I, I really don't understand how in the sixties and seventies people were like n- either not looking for that or they were so like I don't no, nope don't want to see that. Yeah, I it shocks me how little intervention there was for me. Yeah. I, I mean, I was clearly I off the rail. Yeah, 
Mm-hmm. I, yeah. I don't, it, it makes no sense to me. I really no. don't. I don't understand it. But and I think it's you know, partly yeah. because we were girls. That that may be. Yeah. I was. It was very easy for me to blend in. It was very easy for me to hide. Mm-hmm. You know, I was very. Oh, that's. I didn't even say any of that. I was very promiscuous as mm-hmm. a. Um, as a, I, I'm just so. I'm so grateful that nothing came out of that for me. Right. I, I. I was just thinking the other day, like these little images will pop in sometimes, and I'll think dang like i did that like that oh i slept with that guy yeah man, like that was and and you know i you know willingly i was like 13 you know or 12 well i guess it was 12 12 <sighs> 13 or 14 wow um, but drunk always drunk never wow never, kevin never sober you know never sober. um not until years years later but it's not that i didn't like men i just didn't I wasn't particularly attracted to men, but I slept with them anyways. Because but you were you did. thirteen. Jesus Christ! Yeah, 13, you're not. 14. You know, you're a kid. I know. <laughs> I mean, like my my youngest is thirteen. I look right. at it sometimes, and I'm like, Ew, I hope not. That's just yeah, weird. yeah. It's just yeah. it's it doesn't make any sense. And you're mm-hmm. a kid. You're just mm-hmm. a kid. Yeah. yeah. I th- wow. You know, I th- think about that now too. When I'll be working with um, adolescents that are pregnant and are you know, mm-hmm. 14, 15, 16, well, 14, normally 15, 16 years old. Yeah. And um, I just want to be saying, like, it's not not good. I could be having sex now. Yeah. yeah. I just, I, and I, and I probably, I mean, quite honestly, I wouldn't have had this language then, but it wasn't even in my body. So it really didn't, you know, I hate to say it didn't matter, but it really didn't matter. Like, I, yeah. I didn't connect to it in any way. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think I was sad about it. I don't, mm. I don't think I actually really experienced my depression until I was sober. Mm. You know, when I put down alcohol, my depression like came out um, uh-huh. in this way that was, you know, it was uh, fairly powerful. It took a little while. You know, I had my pink cloud the first, you know, three, six months. and Of sobriety. Um, of sobriety. And then had, it, I guess it was about a year and a half sober, went to therapy. And had, I think I had, and I think in, on, on purpose, I wanted a straight woman. I had gone to therapy before that. And I had this, um, she was a lesbian, like bless her heart. Nothing, I have nothing against lesbians. She was a rather heavy woman. Mm-hmm. And I remember saying to her, I have a problem with food. Mm-hmm. And she looked at me and said, you can't, you're too thin. Oh, yeah. And, and I remember thinking to myself when she said that to me, I will never trust you again. Right. Because I was starving myself. I was smoking. I was probably, I mean, you know, at the time weighed, you know, 110 pounds, yeah. you know, five, five. I, I was so underweight, smoking, drinking coffee, not yep. eating, yep. early sobriety, like getting yep. high, honestly. Like, yes. I, mean, I hate to say it like that because I wasn't, but, but there's a, there was a, there's, there's a component of, um, <laughs> what, what happens when you don't eat <laughs> you know what I mean? like yeah there's a buzz you get I mean, there is a buzz you get well it's also a way to sort of control your environment you know it's like it reminds me of anorexia in that regard where you know you get to be in control and early sobriety is nothing if not complete chaos and lack of control Good yeah point. yeah know. no it's totally true Ugh. so then i got this other therapist and she was she was amazing she was the one that would ask me where was your mother mm. And she, she at uh, at some point, I don't know, I don't know what we were talking about. We were talking about women mm-hmm. and relating to women. Mm-hmm. And I remember saying, I, like, I just don't relate to my sister and mother. I just don't understand how they think. Mm-hmm. And her saying to me, "Well, do you feel like a woman?" I, and I said, "Well, what is that supposed to feel like?" <laughs> yeah. Know, like, no, <laughs> but I didn't know to say no. Right. It didn't occur to me. It was 90, 1990 three probably that by then mm-hmm. so i guess i went i must have gone to other therapists when i was about a year and a half i was about three years sober when i went to okay uh-huh. um and where were and you then i was in northampton mass you, That's you where were I in massachusetts got sober yeah i got sober in lesbianville usa stat. nice like smith college i went to smith college after uh, of um, course you did <laughs> yeah went to smith i love i love my experience with smith I, I hear that all the time. Oh, I, I, it was, it was a fantastic experience. It really was. I, mm-hmm. I feel like so much of, um, yeah, I, I just, I love my experience at Smith. And you I, went to Smith, you were still drinking. 
No, no. So oh, I you got, got sober, sober in 1990, and then I, okay. uh, I was about a year and a half. I went to college. Mm-hmm. I went back to college, but I actually never went. I did go and get a $2,500 loan, but I actually didn't go to class. So, um, so I went to I went to uh, Holyoke Community College for, yeah. for three years, and then went to Smith from 93 to 96, and graduated uh, in 96. Um, and I had a series, like you know, my thing. I don't know if uh, other other folks you know, addicts uh, experience or alcoholics experience. I was uh, really uh, deal with my addictions in the order that they'll kill me. You know, I put down, I put down alcohol and drugs, and then I put down smoking. Mm-hmm. Um, I put down, you know, some combination of people uh, mm-hmm. not long after that and, and, and would pick that up. That was, that was probably for, I'd say the, until, until 2000, 2002, um, like the, probably even still now. I can't, I can't, I can't know that for certain. That, but that, um, my relationship to relationships <laughs> mm-hmm. it was, it was terrible. I was a serial monogamous. I could mm-hmm. not be out of a relationship. You know, I thank God. I thank God every day for the sponsor I had when I moved to North Carolina, because he, he actually, <laughs> you've heard this before. He actually said to me, like, "What do you, what do you think you have to offer someone?" <laughs> 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 nothing <laughs> yeah that's tim tim's like yeah like, what do you think you have to offer <laughs> yeah and he was Damn. right I had nothing to, yeah oh zing yeah he, he he was he was uh brutally honest so mm-hmm. I picked him. you know i that, mm-hmm. i knew that's what i needed at 10 mm-hmm. years sober i i had a lot i had a lot to learn mm-hmm. um but i uh so kind of going back i had met this woman in uh 1995 that uh, I'm still friends with today. Her name is mm-hmm. Tanya. I just absolutely adore her. And um, I was really able to be my more of my real self with her than I ever had before. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and how that manifested itself was in this trans man. I didn't, I didn't really understand that. I didn't know that. The 90s, you know, there weren't, there weren't many folks, you know, of course there was Renee Richards in the seventies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the freaks that one saw on Jerry Springer and whatever, yeah. whatever other show there were, Geraldo. Not appealing. Um, yeah. Not appealing at all. And I had this friend in AA who'd been sober probably, you know, four or five years longer than me. I think she just celebrated like 40 years, 38 mm-hmm. years, something like that this year. And um, she was dating this trans man. We went out to lunch Mm-hmm. 1993 it was the same year that i read stone butch blues and um actually i think i met less fine yeah yeah i think wow. i think somehow that happened a pride parade or something like right. that and, um so there was there was some lights on in there but um i, I wasn't ready for that mm-hmm. yet mm-hmm. I, I mean I, I actually remember um leaving boston we were driving out of boston tanya and i I forget if we were driving, I was driving her back to the Cape. I think she was living on the Cape for the summer, making some extra money. And um, it was after we had graduated from Smith and, you know, we're driving down 93. And I, I remember just looking at her and saying, I can't live like this anymore. Mm. I can't, I can't live as a woman. And, uh, and her saying, okay. Yeah. You know, which hilariously, she left me because I was going to be a man and then ended up getting married later. <laughs> they all always do. <laughs> there's, there's, something, there's something weird about people. There, I, um, that is like textbook to me. <laughs> it does seem that way, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm-hmm. But, it, you know, it really, so much of what that was was like her capacity to let me be who I was. hmm uh, and grow into that. Yeah. So, you know, we, we, you know, we, we clearly were not meant to, um, you know, honestly, let be life partners, whatever that's supposed to be. I just want to say this to anybody that's watching, like when you get sober, you not only have you been drinking for however many years you have, you know, years of, of drinking and, and before drinking of bad behavior in a lot of areas of really stunted growth in a lot of areas. So you got, you come to sobriety, not knowing how to relate to people, not knowing how to be in romantic relationships, taking hostages, uh, you know, not knowing how to eat, not knowing how to take care of money, like all these things. So unpacking all that stuff takes a long time. 
you know? Yeah, it really does. Yeah. That's a really good point. I'm glad that you said that. Cause you know, when I got sober, I felt like I was 12. Yeah. Right? Where, where yeah. I was when I really started drinking. Yeah. Cause um, you were. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I just didn't have, I just didn't have that capacity. And that's, you know, that's for me, you know, I feel like it's grace that I found Alcoholics Anonymous because it's the, it's the place I learned how to be an adult. Mm-hmm. I, I need, I needed a place. I think maybe not everyone does. I needed mm-hmm. a place and I needed people. I needed people uh, that were sober, living a sober life to kind of show me what it meant. And at that point I needed, I also needed sober men Yeah. to like, to, to kind of teach me how to be a man. I didn't know how to be a man. Right. I think about that in particular with Tim Yeah. that, you know, I, I picked him because he, you know, he was married. He yeah. had, he had kids. You know, I, I looked to him, you know, for, for cues. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, some of the best things, I mean, I, although he always sounds a little bit um, blunt <laughs> to say the least, I think I'd been working with him about a year and a half and, you know, it was, it was time to start dating. And, you know, I'm like, Tim, what am I going to, what am I going to tell him? Like, I, I don't, I don't know a dick. Like, I don't even know what to do. And mm-hmm. It's like, Kevin, every guy worries about their dick size. <laughs> 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 you know, like, like totally, just yes, totally disarmed <laughs> all of my arguments. He, and that was his way. Like he could yeah. disarm my arguments. Yeah. You know, like yeah. your arguments, you're not, you're not so different than everybody else. Right. Like, and that's the thing that the beauty of working with other people mm-hmm. is that it disarms these, these, stories you know, the, 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 this stuff that yeah. just gets you know i could i could make a mountain out of a molehill you know yeah yeah all this all this uh mental gymnastics and, and you know that's the the last you know 20 years has been uh-huh. i really feel like I, I didn't get sober until i was 10 years sober um the the you know the 20 years after that have been you know picking up the rest of it yeah yeah and finding out who I really am. There's this, there's this uh, author that I really like, speaker. His name's Richard Rohr. And uh, some of his writings are about like the first and second half of life. And, I, and I re- it really it resonates with me because I do feel like uh, the, almost the whole first half of my life, I was just seeking an answer to something, mm-hmm. seeking an answer. Mm-hmm. And, and, and now I more feel like I'm just sitting in the unknowing. Mm-hmm. It's like, I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I don't really need it as much. Mm-hmm. Not that I still don't sometimes want some answer, but, mm-hmm. um, but I don't have to have it the way that I used to feel like I did. Yeah. Um, and it, and it is, there's certainly, you know, maybe, maybe it is like post 50. I feel like other people are like 50 plus say similar things that I just don't really worry as much about, sometimes I still think about what people think of me, but for the most part, I don't really worry about what people are thinking of me. And mostly I, because I have that, I, th- I have that connection to my higher power, what mm. you know, I choose to call God. I do, you know, I, I kind of, I consider myself a Christian today, uh-huh. which I never thought I would. I mean, that in itself is hilarious to me. Like, hilarious. <laughs> like, I, I, like I, I am amused by myself far too often because like, I, because all the, the things that I said in childhood, like that I would never do, mm. I've, I've become. Um, <laughs> like well, I, sobriety I is like that. It's like, yeah, a, this, it's, it's, it's yeah. a trick, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's a trick. Because <laughs> I remember I was copping dope on, on Second Avenue in New York City, and I, it was like, seven in the morning and people were nine in the morning, people were getting out and they were getting ready to go to work. And I remember looking out at those people and, and feeling just an absolute disdain for those people. Like, I don't want to be that. I can't imagine being that. Look at those suckers going to work, you know, having a job, all this stuff. And then you get into, you get into recovery and like you, you find out that, um, actually no you really do like people you actually yeah. do enjoy um work of some sort you know like yeah <laughs> i found myself doing things like yoga you know <laughs> yeah. am i frozen it, where you are yes you're yeah. frozen i was just yeah. going to tell you yes your yeah. pictures your pictures frozen yeah so you're talking i can hear you That's and you're good. delightful but your lips aren't moving it's kind of it's kind of eerie it's yeah kinda cool it's like a bad uh, ventriloquist. ventriloquist. Yes, <laughs> you see the little guy like yeah. that, just waiting to see the person behind you. 
you know it's really just a bad yeah it's bad, bad ventriloquist yeah. so yeah. so yeah so um you're you're in sobriety you know you you finding yourself tell me before all that like finding yourself stuff like what was going on i mean you, you met your wife and like what happened with the depression? Let's reel back to that. What happened? Okay, reel back to the depression. So I went on antidepressants for well, for uh, I think about a year and a half. What do you I think, think that I, was about? Like, was it about not having a, a a coping mechanism? Well, today I would say I I I think that my brain um, was unable to regulate. That's what I think. I mean, mm -hmm. at the time, it just felt like there was a cloud over everything. I was mm. just always sad. Uh -huh. um, and the beauty of antidepressants, I went on Paxil for, it was about a year and a half. The beauty of that was that for the first time in like in that early, like that, that, I guess it, you know, like, so early sobriety, it just felt like chaos. Like, yeah. Like I, I, you're just kind of mocus, you have no idea what's going on. But after that kind of passed, then I just felt this overwhelming sadness. And, and honestly, I, I picked through all sorts of stuff. Like I thought maybe I had been sexually abused as a child. Uh, uh, I, I, I never had any memories of that. Uh, I really don't remember my childhood well, but. Uh -huh. Well, honestly, so, Kevin, sleeping with people, with, a, you know, older people at the age of 13 sounds pretty traumatic. Yeah. There, and it, although to, to me, I mean, just so that you know, for whatever reason, it has not ever occurred to me that way. Well, that's great. Uh, and, and I feel very lucky. I, I feel lucky in a lot of ways. Yeah. When I transitioned, um, I didn't have nearly the, I'm going to call it anger. Yeah. I didn't have nearly the anger that the guy, some other guys that I knew. I, went, I was in a group that um, I did group therapy. Oh, a T um, During a my transition. Uh, yeah. And um, there were like three other guys and four women. So uh -huh. There were eight of us in their therapy and yeah yeah i just wasn't nearly i didn't hate myself the way that they did but i right. also was you know when i transitioned i was six years sober uh-huh you know i'd done i'd done a lot of work before that yeah um that's when i transitioned I had, too yeah yeah I, yes isn't that yeah. funny I yeah. something about that six years yeah and you know i had gotten absent and, and overeaters anonymous mm -hmm. um and had started to um <laughs> started to that is the never-ending <laughs> that is a never-ending issue, food, I have to say. That's a whole other program. We could talk about that for an hour. Oh, um, my God. Can I just interject? Yeah. Just this yeah. morning, I was having this conversation with my sponsor about how I gave myself permission to eat a pint of ice cream last week. Mm -hmm. And it set off the phenomenon of craving to the degree that I was so uncomfortable for like three or four days. It, I was yeah. miserable. I just, I wanted ice cream. I wanted chocolate. I, you know, it was bad. Yeah. I, I, I cannot eat sugar. Yeah. I'm doing keto right now. Yeah. I, I just, I cannot eat sugar. Wow. And the other like, like, like monk fruit and things like that. I, I feel like I can, there's some sort of management in my body. My body does not regulate things the way that other people's does. Uh -huh. Or my mind doesn't. I don't, I don't know if it's my body or my mind. I, I feel like it's, it's all a combination. The, it, yeah, it's all of the above. Yeah. Yeah. So there's some sort of the chemical, like putting the alcohol down. Uh -huh. I, I think I needed antidepressants. So a couple of things. So I did that. Yeah. And then like in hindsight, I would say that um, I am a person who who becomes situationally depressed. Mm -hmm. I don't think that I necessarily have the overarching bio biological issue, like a, a an imbalance of um, hormones, mm -hmm. but that that situations do that. Like my I was talking about earlier that my mom died yeah. uh, a couple of years ago. And I remember going to the doctor. I mean, I just wasn't sleeping. There's a bunch of things that were going on. And and she's a, she was a newer doctor for me. And uh -huh. I had had this doctor for 20 years who I adored and had to switch practices and she retired. And, and she, she just kind of leaned in and said, well, Kevin, it kind of sounds like you're depressed. Mm. <laughs> it's like, does? <laughs> 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 but, I, but I was open. Like, we, what do we do? We, um, she, gave me, um, she gave me something to sleep at night. Uh-huh. Trazodone and, or something. Yep. Trazodone. Yep. Yeah. Give me Trazodone. And um, just saying it out loud, I was able to start exercising again. Mm. I had really, a lot of that stuff I had been, I, it had stopped. Yeah. 
like I am a person that has to ex- I have to exercise regularly. Yeah, same. same. I must. I yeah. must. If I if I don't, I'm I'm so prone. I'm so prone to depression. But I really yeah. have been, um, I would say, un unmedicated. Mm-hmm. Um, which you know, of course, I drink coffee every day. So am I unmedicated? No. I mean, you know, what does that mean? I just you know, I just I just do other medication. Mean, there's other things that I use. Yeah. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with coffee. I don't right. mean that. But right. um. And by the way, you are still frozen. But it's funny to ask the question, like, what is going on for you? Mm. And I don't, I don't know if I, I conveniently forget mm-hmm. or if I have like this mechanism for clean slateism. Mm-hmm. but I just don't remember. Mm-hmm. I just, I just don't, I don't, I, I, maybe I don't attach to it anymore. Yeah. So I just don't, it's just not, it's just not where I am. Yeah. And I've, and I've, and I don't even say that, but I don't think that's necessarily always healthy. I've done that. Um, I've moved a couple of times and yeah. maybe I'm not in contact with people who I used to adore. Like I did that OA for like two and a half years and I'm mm-hmm. not in contact with any of the people mm-hmm. that, you know, my sponsor or. I think it's a powerful uh, coping mechanism. I, I don't know if this, if you resonate with this, but I can tell you that doing this EMDR therapy, it's bringing up stuff that I thought I was okay with and that I have so um, siloed and car- compartmentalized and minimized. I really thought I was okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's really possible. It's a really strong f- way for me to be able to move in the world. I've just siloed a lot of stuff. Yeah. I don't know. Like, I don't know. I don't know. At this point, I um, don't care about it. Yeah. Yeah. As long as you're, uh, I just don't care well. about it. Yeah. I mean the place the place I am now, I mean I'm I'm in I'm in another little groove of of goodness. <laughs> you know? That's fantastic. So yeah, tell me about I, yeah. that. What what how did you get yeah. to that and why is that happening? <laughs> yeah, I wish I knew because uh but I have them more frequently. That I can say. In the last well, I know it. Like, you know, I know what it is. I, I practice meditation faithfully. Mm, mm-hmm. I mean I you know. And, and even during that time that my mom died, like all of, all of mm-hmm. that. So it wasn't just that my mom died. So in two, the end of 2008, well, even back to that, like, I think it was like 2014 or 16, my mom came mm-hmm. to live with my wife and I to take care of my kids. And um, after living with us for two years, we asked her to leave. Yeah. Um, because I remember that. it was too much really on my wife. Yeah. And, you know, she was kind of saying, you know, it's either her or me and I'm yeah. not going to put my mother like bless guys hearts that like put their mothers before their wives. That was yeah. not going to be me. Yeah. Um, so he asked to leave and it was very, very difficult. It strained our re- relationship for a long time. Yeah. And I had, I mean, Sam, you know, I had a resentment against my mother for years. Yes. Yes. Years and years at some point at the, I mean, at point so badly that I like couldn't even call her because I was just angry. With I remember all the time, remember. you know, and so she, we, we decided that she was going to come visit us. I remember saying to Tim, I think it was this time, she was coming for Christmas in 2018. Uh-huh. And I remember asking Tim if I could, um, if I could get like some kind of sedative, <laughs> if I could get, some, if I could get Xanax it. or something. And he was like, Shut no, up. you can't get Xanax. I'm like, come on, Tim. Like, can I, because Christmas is going to be so stressful. Oh my you know, God. at least I would say that stuff out loud. Yes, I, right. I do. I do. I, I feel grateful that I say that stuff. I say that. I tell her myself. Yeah, yeah. So she came, um, she came December 18th, mm-hmm. 19th, something like that. December, her birthday was the 15th. So it was right after her birthday. And she, she just wasn't feeling herself. She had kind of COPD. She was 77. Yeah. And um, she just, yeah, just turned 77. She wasn't feeling great or whatever, but, you know, didn't, we didn't really know what was going on. She was describing this other stuff she'd been going through. She had lost some weight mm-hmm. uh, and she had had some tests run uh, by her doctor before she came to visit us. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, when she left our house, she had lived with my brother for a little while, which is a very dysfunctional place. Uh-huh. And then she went and um, was living with my niece. And that was a burden on my niece. And she knew it. Yeah. But, like that was going okay. Yeah. So she came to visit us for Christmas and ended up going to the hospital um, Christmas Eve. Yeah. So Christmas Eve, she's, she goes to the hospital in the middle of the night. And um, she had RSV because the kids, Jen, my niece's kids had had whatever RSV is, some kind of virus. And okay. because she had COPD, it attacked her lungs really badly. Yeah. So she she was 
she was sick, like yeah. really, really sick. And while we were in the hospital, she, we found out that she had um, ovarian cancer and had less than six months to live. Right. Damn. And um, and she and I decided, like, so she's in the hospital, go to visit her Christmas Day, you know, in the, in the days between mm-hmm. Christmas and New Year's Eve when she got home. Yeah. And um, we invited her to come and live with us. Mm-hmm. And uh, she lived wow. with us the 11 months that she lived. Wow. Most beautiful thing was, um, and also sort of a tragic thing. As soon as I found out that she had cancer, all my resentment went away. You know, which is beautiful and tragic. Wow. Right? That it takes knowing that someone's going to die for you to be able to let go of that shit, you know? Yeah. And... And we did that 11 months. They were, they were probably the best 11 months of her life. Like she got to travel. <laughs> Everything was taken care of her. I she remember loved, you, were, I mean, you were running to get her food from where, where was she oh, always yeah. like? Bojangles. Bojangles. Yeah, Bojangles yes. biscuits. Oh yeah. <laughs> you take her for a ride. And the other thing that came from that, that was so beautiful. is I had this opportunity to get to know my brother better. Uh, um, my brother is the favorite. I say that to like he is the favorite, yeah. and, and we know it. Yeah. Um, my sister can't admit it the way that that I, I I've come to. Uh-huh. Um, she just she loved him differently. Yes. It really was okay. Like I I came to a place where I, it was okay. I gotcha. My my mother yeah. was like that with my brother, and it was like yeah, yeah it's okay, it's all right. Yeah, it's just yeah, it just it became okay. It wasn't yeah. okay for a long time. But yeah, it became same, same. Okay. same thing. And I'm and I'm so grateful for that. But I, and he came to visit like every three weeks. Wow. You know, he'd, he'd come, like we use our Southwest miles. I got a Southwest card. Uh-huh. Um, she had a little bit, bit of money, so she'd pay for his plane ticket. Plane tickets were pretty cheap then. Yeah. You know, it cost him a couple, maybe 150, 180 bucks to come. He'd come for a long weekend. Nice. Um, he'd work a little bit from here. Uh-huh. Uh, it's, and it's a gift that she gave me. She gave us this gift. Wow. Of getting to know her. And the weird, some of the weirdest things, um, so when you when you Google Earth, my my house, uh-huh. if you zoom in on the front porch, uh-huh. she's sitting on it. You can see her what? laying in what? the hammock. She's laying in the hammock. That's wild. Is that crazy? That's it wild. It's I like a it ghost. Yeah, it's, it's really weird. Because she sat on the porch. They called her the porch lady. Uh-huh. She sat on the porch <laughs> for, lady. you know, yeah, from March until she, just just about till she dies. I mean, wow, it was warm that year. Well, that's not true. She was probably it was probably October, November. Yeah, um, but she was out there. She was out there all the eating, time, eating the bojangles. Yeah, eating bojangles, drinking lots of tea, on sweet tea. Uh huh. I remember that's, that. You know, that's one of the gifts of of this this time. And 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 during that whole time. I meditated faithfully and I had mm-hmm. started meditating about a year, year, probably two years, pretty faithfully before that. I, I guess I always when, did think that the 11th step was optional because I just didn't meditate. <laughs> when you <laughs> say didn't. meditate, that means a lot of different things to different people. Yeah. Tell me true. what you mean by that. Yeah. So um, this other guy in AA that we know, um, mm-hmm. he, uh, he challenged us to a 365 days of meditation mm-hmm. on this, app called insight timer uh-huh so on insight timer it's almost all guided meditation on insight yeah timer. um sometimes it's like a, a meditation and then sitting for a, a period of time yeah it might be loving kindness meditation I and mean, there are like you said there's just so many different kinds of of sitting yes but it's 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 the sitting with either silence or with with someone talking about something yes um and and in this 365 days of meditation, it started out day one, yeah, one minute, one minute. Wow. Day two is two minutes. Uh-huh. So the first 10 days, you just added one minute. Yeah. And, and it was, it was a great experience. And then I started, you know, so then I would start kind of branching out. Um, and then uh, during the uh, pandemic, I, I really think it was day one. Mm-hmm. This, um, this, a group of women that I meditated with from church mm-hmm. decided that we were going to start doing a Zoom meditation. Oh, nice! And we're still doing it. I still oh, I don't great. I don't go as regularly as I used to, but um, I my times just don't fit with the time right now. Yeah. So I still meditate in the morning. And for me, what that means is I do it somewhere between depending on how how much time I leave myself uh, five to twenty minutes. Yeah. I lay. I don't sit because I don't uh-huh. sit well. 
Uh-huh. I lay on the ground and, um, or I lay on my yoga mat. Uh-huh. I listen to I, uh, Sarah Blondin is my, my new favorite. I do okay. like guided meditation more uh-huh. than, um, than complete silence. Although I, I could sit for 20 minutes. And so yeah. If necessary. Gotcha. Um, I also uh, meditate with James Finley, who is another one of my okay. favorites. He's a Trappist monk. Uh-huh. He's pretty awesome. Cool. And so mainly it means sitting in some combination of listening to something. And then there's this whole, like the, the um, I don't know, if, I don't know if in like three sentences or less, I could describe uh, the theology that I have uh, sort of found uh-huh. I'm drawn to. Uh-huh. Um, but it's, I would call it mis- mystical Christianity. Yeah. It's sort of, um, which, which feels to me in my, I did not grow up in church. So a lot of it, I just sort of make up the words because I don't mm-hmm. really, I don't really, I don't have that background. Mm-hmm. It, it seems to me like a cross of, um, of sort of Buddhism, a Hinduism and Christianity. Uh-huh. I t- did I tell you I studied with a Christian mystic for a while? No. Yeah. No, no. Yeah, I, I did. And I, if oh, I, yeah. when my, it, his name escapes me, but he's a gay Christian mystic and he's amazing. He's mm. got some fantastic books. I'll have to tell you about yeah. him when it comes to my, but, but I agree um, that me- meditation is uh, a, a game changer. It really is. I can yeah. sit with myself much more easily. That's it's amazing. easier to be quiet. Yeah. I, I see that in you. So it's really, um, that's a testament, you know, I see that in you. I'm glad something's coming out of it. <laughs> so, uh, so how's everything else? Are you doing all right? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a good, it's a good time. Yeah. You know, I, I signed up for um, a season. I'm calling it my season of uh, sprint triathlon. So I have, I had four, I have four mm-hmm. this spring. My fourth is the weekend after Memorial Day weekend. Uh, and then I have two uh, in the fall. And they're going to be a little bit longer ones. So I have um, things to train for. Um, she and I uh, have some trips planned. Yeah. Uh, we're going to the beach to finally let go of my mom's ashes. Oh, wonderful. Um, it's taken forever to get this trip together because yeah. that's how long things happen with COVID. Yeah. So we're going to go. I think, you know, I, I, I still struggle, uh, I would say, with, um, with relationship. Like she and I, I don't, I don't want to say we struggle, but there's just, there's often a um, need for uh, direct conversation mm-hmm. with her about mm-hmm. something that I'm worried about. Mm-hmm. You know, like the, I don't know, I don't know if um, she takes longer to process things maybe than I do or uh-huh. process things differently. I shouldn't say longer, uh-huh. but differently. So I, I don't know, you know, I, sometimes I think, well, you know, if she's something's going on, she'll tell me. Yeah. You know, I'll let, I'll try to let it go. But then I, then I'm like, well, but maybe I should ask. So I don't always, so I still don't do well with that. You're, um, you're fiery and she's a slow burn. Yes. Yes. That is, yes. That, yeah. Yes, I, I can relate to that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that, and that, um, it, it sometimes creates challenges. Yeah. Uh, today, like the sermon today, um, relate was, um, saying yes. Mm. Why is it so hard to say yes? Ah, and um, but the other part was the other part. I already forgot. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll think of it later after we're off. But um, you know, I wonder sometimes, you know, why it's so hard for for us to say yes together. Mm. Like, why is it so difficult for us to say yes together? Um, we actually purchased some of our first art. We've been married. We'll have been married eighteen years. <laughs> wow! And we actually bought art today. Wow. Congratulations. Um, yeah. Thank you. It felt, it felt like a big deal. Yeah. And we've been going to Art Explosure downtown Raleigh right. for like 15 years and have, have just never been able to pull the trigger. I would have bought a hundred pieces of art by now. Yeah. And none of it ever had fit her. It hasn't passed. And for whatever that. reason, she, it, it just doesn't pass the, yeah. yeah. Like, I don't know. I don't know what that test was, but yeah. that sermon today, like motive, I think it motivated it her. Opened her up. Say yes. Yeah. Like say yes. Like oh, I love it. Yes. I love that. Yeah. That's so a good. Gr- that's a great thing to leave us with. I think. Yeah. Say yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> say yes. Is, well, thank you for you saying to, yes yeah. to this this conversation. I really appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I wish you could see my mouth move. 
you know, it, it has been kind of weird. I, I, ended yeah. up, I ended up focusing on myself after a while because Good. it's just kind of weird. Not I, I'm like, mm, I, can't, well, I, I, I think you're better looking anyway. So, you know, that's what <laughs> that. I don't know what that they do say I have good legs, but you're not looking at my legs. So. You do have very, very nice legs. It's true. You look good. In I a think I'm better shorts. from behind. I look, I look better from behind. <laughs> Hate to see Running you leave, away. but love to watch you walk away. Bye. Bye. <laughs> anyway. Well, thanks, Sam. This was fun. Yeah, good. I'm glad.